Officially, Councillor Malus represented the old Aran Union's interests in the tribe of Arash. Unofficially, that meant spending every working day dealing with snarling mouth breathers who hadn't evolved to a high enough state to communicate without slobbering drool all over their conversation partner. The Clacans were much better. They used pheromones he couldn't smell and chirps and clicks he could hardly distinguish from each other. It only fit their simple caste system. The workers were probably too stupid for the real mark of sapiens. Malus, like all other Alderans, and unlike all other sapient species, had two brains in his skull. The hindbrain handled all the disgusting biological necessities, breathing, eating, sleeping, motor skills, leaving the upper brain free to reach out and communicate with another of his kin. Alderans spoke to each other by sharing their memories, a pure language where symbols and meanings were one and the same. All the clunkiness of syntax and grammar were placed in the trash disposal where it belonged, with a tongue and teeth never needed to learn how to phonate. Needless to say, it was quite an adjustment, mentally and physically, to be able to speak Urashi, the tongue of this particular Rathi tribe. Malus was bewildered and not the least infuriated that the Twelve Tribes didn't have a universal language. Unfortunately, he couldn't collect muscle memory from his predecessor, that belonged to his hindbrain and his hindbrain alone, but he could learn to fluently interpret the entire language, grunts, growls, snarls and all, from an afternoon sharing memories with the previous counsellor. Since then, he had learned more or less how to phonate their language. They had surprisingly dexterous tongues, and he'd never needed his for anything more than finishing up a gelatin cup. It got infinitely more complex when he had to combine the action of his tongue with a curl of the lips or just the right opening of the jaw, and even worse when he had to hold the tongue right where it was and let everything else move around it. Malus learned the other limitation of oral language rather quickly when Far Queen Dredotri arrived, the new emissary to the Queen of Queens to Urash. No amount of tongue exercises would help him learn how to click his non-existent mandibles, and clicking his tongue wasn't nearly precise enough. So in front of their three seated dials in the Hall of the Concord, the Far Queen, Malus and Gremsa, Urash's brown-furred low-brown liaison, had installed a universal translator capable of turning Raffi grunts into clacking clicks and vice versa. So rare was it for Urash, smallest of the Raffi tribes and the farthest flung from known space, to spark an international incident, that this was the first time Malus and his colleagues had needed to sit on a tribunal together. But here, a little Urashi patrol frigate had found a clacking ship belonging to some small and insignificant ship queen trespassing on their frontier. Ship Queen Rokaki, our fat finding investigation is complete, growled Gremza on Malice's right. Your ship was discovered by one of our patrol frigates in our frontier zone, in space specially guaranteed to us by the Concord for our peaceful expansion. You had no permission to be there. If you were a RAF, the punishment would be capital. Far below their dais stood, or more appropriately, sat the Ship Queen. They had provided some modicum of cushions for her, given her egg swollen abdomen. It did make her look pitiful that she would lose her ship and all means of providing for her brood right in the middle of hatching it. Far Queen Dridotri had clearly coached her sister well. As far as Malus could tell, the Ship Queen wore an appropriately chastened face for a bug. How do you defend your actions? Gremza asked. It is true that my ship and I were found and so capably assisted by the crew of your frigate, Prokaki answered. The Universal Translator was a clever enough machine to get across her diplomatic, albeit digitized tone. However, I believe the Concorde gave me suitable permission to leave subspace in your frontier zone. My ship was undergoing a severe emergency that had already cost the lives of a number of my crew. It was within my right to enter normal space and send out a distress call. Gremza grilled her. What was the nature of the emergency? Her reply was well rehearsed. Some biological cargo broke loose and needed to be recaged. Unfortunately, my crew alone were incapable of recapturing it. Where did you get this cargo? I took it from an uncharted well, deep in the unclaimed zone, as part of a scientific expedition. Malus thought that was a misstep. Judging by the way Gremza's canine shined, so did he. May I remind you, Ship Queen, that lying to a tribunal is also a capital offence. Our investigation found no such license for a scientific expedition, under the requirements of the Concord in your ship's logs. Perhaps your investigators are unfamiliar with Clackan computer systems, I have it here. With a wave of her claw, one of her ship drones stepped forward, pinching a data disk. This is highly irregular, Ship Queen, Grimms countered. Once the fact-finding investigation is complete, no additional evidence can be admitted to the tribunal. 
I motion to admit the evidence. Far Queen Dridotri interrupted on Malice's left. I believe the Ship Queen has provided sufficient reason that the Ushi investigation might not have been as thorough as previously claimed. Gremza glared at her from across the dais. To her credit, the Far Queen stared down the short nosed beast, but so much of a hint of that odor that Malice was told was clack and fear scent. It was up to him, the Alderan, to second or leave the motion unsupported. He felt inclined to leave it. Grimza had more than enough proof of what the Ship Queen was carrying aboard her ship. He had the genuine article of illegal sapient trafficking. On the other hand, Malice was curious to see how far the Far Queen would go to protect the Ship Queen, or at least to keep her cargo for her own. He'd always heard the rumours of how much a Queen was willing to do for the promise of more credits, and he wondered if the price was high enough in illegal clack and organics markets. I second the motion, Malice stated in garbled wrathy. A raft took the data disk and inserted it into an appropriate scanner. Sure enough, among the ship's logs was inserted a license from the same clacking colony Rokaki had departed from on her so-called expedition. It was reportedly certified on the same day she left, and Malice bet that if they tried to verify with the colony queen there, she would testify to that while counting her own share of the pot. Well, ship queen, that is very convenient, grumbled Gremza. His first attack had been blunted, but he came in with another. Are you aware, Ship Queen, of the Concourse mandates regarding sapient trafficking? I am. I will remind you again that you may not lie to this tribunal. Were you trafficking sapients on your scientific expedition? Rokaki glanced over at the Far Queen. Drudotri's right antenna twitched very deliberately. I was not. Grimza chuckled. Bring in Article 1, he ordered a Raffi attendant. The door opened into the room led by two lumbering guards, set a bipedal, peach-skinned creature, probably twice as tall as Malice, and, to his surprise, almost as hairless, aside from the crop of black on the very top of his head. It wore a shirt, coat, and pants almost as finely adorned as Malice's clothes, clearly tailored just for the occasion. Nothing cuffed his wrists or bound his ankles. Gremza had taken great care to make sure everyone in the room knew this was an intelligent creature. It walked freely up to where his guards stopped, looking up at all the galleries of Rathi watching the tribunal's proceedings. His roving gaze met Malice. Malice furrowed his brow in disappointment. It was probably sapient, in the Rathi and Clacken sense of the term, but his skull was clearly not elongated enough to accommodate an upper brain. It still had a few million years of evolution left before it could even come close to the shared minds of the Alderans. This is the creature you took from his planet, is it not? It is. And you say it is not sapient? Rokaki's eyes darted momentarily to Dredotri's. Yes. Show us the feed, Gremza said while he leered at the ship queen. On the screen that took up half the wall, they watched an expertly edited video. It dispersed between shots of the creature under Gremza's supervision, comfortably solving logical puzzles and completing the abstract pattern on its own task screen. It shows shots taken right from the video feeds aboard Rokaki's ship. The creature, naked, escaping its cell by jamming its tray in the access port. The creature making its own improvised loincloth from some torn up fabric, a bag to carry its things, experimenting with a laser cutter it found. Then the video showed the creature in combat, wailing away at clacking soldier drones and ship drones with a pipe, picking up their weapons and turning them on them, using one as an improvised shield, ambushing them from behind closets and around corners, shooting at the cameras it came across, surrendering calmly to the wrath that clearly bested it. Malice felt his chest. His heart was pounding. He never felt this way watching Feast before even during those graphic death plays that Raffi loved. A bead of sweat rolled down the side of his face. It was only for a flash, hardly long enough for any detail, but he saw his own hand bashing a clacken with a length of pipe. Only his hand was bigger, meatier, peachier, and had another finger. And despite the heat of the moment, he felt himself on the verge of tears. He looked down in alarm at the human, who was craning his head in his hands. Is it all right? He inquired, leaning forward. The face shot up to look straight back at him, eyes betraying a sudden coexistence of what he had just said. His lips drew back, showing off some pearly white teeth, and it bowed excitedly. Malice blinked and saw an Alderan, much too large, leaning down from a pulpit. No, a dais, hewn from stone. Then he blinked again and he was back where he sat. He recognised the faux masonry in the room. He knew the dais had been oddly proportioned so that it always drew the eye upward, making the free occupants tower over the court floor below. This was not possible. This couldn't be possible. No one but the Alderans could speak in memories. This creature didn't have the skull volume for it. This creature didn't have two brains. 
Suddenly the word creature lost all meaning in Malice's mind, at least when describing what stood below him. It had a name in a language utterly alien to any raffy tongue or clack and chirp, a name that had just burrowed its way into Malice's head. This was no creature, it was a human. Malice started to hyperventilate. The human was cocking its, no, his head, brows knit with concern. Are you alright, Counselor? Grimes asked, calling him out from his fright. I'm fine. He waved the raff off. Without a doubt, that thing is sapient. You don't know that, screeched the Far Queen and Hokaki simultaneously. All you saw was a clearly doctored video, said Hokaki. This is a travesty against the Concord if that video is admitted into this tribunal, cried Deidrotri. Will you motion to disclude it, Far Queen? Gremza asked, grinning. The Far Queen glared at Malice. Some kind of pepper wafted into his nostrils. Her antenna twitched. No. Down below, Rokaki's shoulders fell. Given this undisputed evidence, I believe the tribunal has reached a sentence regarding you, Ship Queen Rokaki. Gremza placamed. Malice remained practically catatonic, avoiding the human's curious glances as much as he could. While the rest of the room increasingly ignored his untranslated grunts, his mind panicked as it found itself understanding more and more. I understand you. You understand me. Please go home, the human pleaded over and over again. No, that couldn't happen. Malas hadn't thrown up the mental walls in time. The human must have seen the vault of his mind, the memories of generations past he had received when he joined the highest ranks of the service. He must know now about the unknown. He must know what the Union never told the Rathi, the Clackens, or his own people. If this human was the example for his species, Malice could never return him home. No one could ever visit this Earth ever again, or else the secret of a millennium might get out. For perjuring a tribunal of the Concord, and for engaging in illegal sapient trafficking, all in favour of sentencing Ship Queen Hokaki to death? Gremza asked, raising his forepaw. The human turned to look at the Ship Queen. The face was hard for Melissa to read, even with their newly forged mental link. Was it pity? Even so, she deserved the penalty for bringing such a danger to the Concord and the Union. Malice raised his hand. The Far Queen could stall things, since the Tribunal needed a unanimous vote to pass the sentence of death. She could drag the proceedings out, obtain a lesser penalty for her sister. But there was absolutely no chance of any credits in it for her, now that the creature's sapience had been established. She raised her folklore. This tribunal sentences you, Ship Queen Rokaki, to death by death world. You'll be exiled to the planet Sardis for your crimes. And what of this creature? Are you going to send it back to its home? The Ship Queen screeched, enraged. If I may, Gremza, Malice interrupted his colleague's reply. I motion for the creature to also be sentenced to death by death world. What? The Universal Translator cried in three voices at once. This creature is clearly extremely dangerous, given that it tore through nearly the entire crew of a Clacken ship. It has also been exposed to highly advanced technology. If its fellows are anything like it, returning it to its homeworld would unnecessarily expose the Concord to another threat on its borders, not unlike the unknown. Malice's hardened heart sunk. He saw tears on the human's face run down his own. Why? It asked, in a very small voice. Why? Why would you? Malice couldn't look at it. But he felt the human pressing on his mind, forcing him to recall a place he had never seen before. He grit his teeth and lashed back out at the verdant green and blue skies he saw in the foreign memory. The skies were now lit by falling stars, and the trees were burning in an unquenchable fire. The human sniffled. Malice thought that he got the message. It wasn't personal. It was just him looking out for the human race and his own. But instead, he saw the human look up and narrow his eyes at him. You will pay. I second the motion, Far Green Dredotri said, satisfied with a solution that left nobody in possession of what she couldn't have for her own. This is highly irregular, but I suppose, Gremser decided, influenced by how convicted the Alderaan counselor seemed. Very well, this creature will also be sent to Sardis for the threat it poses to the security of the Concord. And what of Rokaki's crew? Drones can't serve queens that didn't hatch them, Rudotri quickly answered to omit any other alternatives. They should be sent down to Sardis as well. Malice gave a deflated but relieved sigh as the human was shuffled out of the courtroom, 
Breaking the mental link. I agree. Then they go to Sardis too, Gremza muttered. I hope they all enjoy their reunion.